Okay. So before we begin, recall last time we saw this simple calibration algorithm that was iterative. What it would do is it would look for level sets on which the current predictor was not currently calibrated. It would shift to those. We proved that decreased squared error, and then it would do it again. And since it decreased squared error, you know, eventually it halted. And then it was observed in class that like in this case, you could have done all of the shifts in parallel. And we saw at least one example where that was better and that it led to, you know, both, both methods lead to zero squared error, but sorry, zero calibration error. But we saw an example in which the simultaneous method um, led, to, um, led to lower squared error. And so I said, uh, for homework, why don't you go and, and uh, prove which one's always better? And probably thought I was joking, but I'm going to randomly call on one person to present their solution. So I, I'm going to close their close my eyes. They're going to come up here and um, and and derive the answer on the board. So, Natalie. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's do it. Oh wow. Okay. Do I put this in my pocket? Any more important is right, Hello? Hello? I'm pretty loud on her. Probably don't need this. Okay. Cool, cool. Yeah. So um so the claim, and you can all catch me if you feel like this is wrong, is that indeed we've seen an example where the sequential is so we can have like we have sequential, right? And we've seen an example where sequential um leads to lower squared error then sorry sequential is the higher squared element parallel right and the claim i'm going to make is that this is always going to be the case um you're never going to be able to do better um in sequential than you are in parallel because remember when i say this what i mean is like in terms of like in terms of squared error okay so how am i going to prove this so i'm going to look at the sequential right so we're going to have like some f and then it's going to go through this algorithm and it's going to end up with some f prime and I'm going to show that, you know, if we look at how this looks, how the error looks at the end in terms of squared error, then it's never going to be lower than it would be in the parallel version. Okay, so let's start here and think about the different level sets, right? So I could think about this F as being in terms of uh, the M different, like I could divide all of D into like M different sets of points, right? That are all like S1 to SM which each represent like the group of points that are all being mapped to one particular value, right? Because we agreed when we took this F that it has to like have like a finite range, which is the things that it maps to. Okay, so let's make the first observation. No matter what happens, F prime is never gonna take two points that are in the same set and map them to different predictions, right? We can think about what it's doing at every single step, it's going to uh, look at a particular level set, and it's going to change everything in that level set to a different prediction, right? So there's no way it's going to split up any two things in one set. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that we can make some guarantee on what the structure of F prime looks like. It's definitely going to map all of the levels, everything in one level set from F to the same value. Okay, so call this class F, which does that. Now I'm going to optimize over all possible Fs which an F prime we know is somewhere in there, right? So here's F, and then here's some F prime, right? This is like a family, right? So basically like, okay, so what does it mean to, to optimize over this? So if I look at any particular thing in here, because of the like particular structure I've defined, I can think about the squared error as being like this. So I'm gonna look at every single value in, in RF. So these are like all the different level sets, right? Um, and I'm gonna say, Okay, like how do I calculate the squared error? I can do this. And what is this XSB? This is one of the particular sets I'm defining over there. And um, let me get this up here. Uh, 
great. Yeah. Um, okay, so do you all buy that this is the expression that I can always write for the squared error for anything in this F? Basically, here I'm talking about, um, right? Like, I'm just like, this is like the classic definition, right? Does it make sense, everyone? Yes, not F prime. They could be different, right? Um, okay, so, and that in particular, um, every for every single V in RF, like it has to be the case that I'm gonna be defining, like that F prime SV, like has to be the same for every single um, X and SV. Okay, so if I want to minimize this, right, the sum, so I can minimize it in terms of every particular thing in the sum. And so what does that mean? Like, well, every particular thing in the sum, I'm just writing like minimize, pick the best SV, right, of this. And we already know what this is. Um, we've talked about it a lot in your class. It's gonna be exactly the mean, right? It's gonna be like the expectation of uh, Y, given that X is an SV, right? Okay, well, what is that? What it's saying is the best thing in F is the thing that takes everything in the level set of F. I'm really overlaying F here, um, but like the family F, and it puts it to exactly its mean. And that's exactly what parallel is doing. So because we know F prime has to be in this family and the best thing in this family is the value that parallel gets, it can't be better than parallel. <laughs> Plus. Uh, yay. Next. Yeah. Oh, no. Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you, Natalie. Um, right, so what are we doing today? So I wanna talk about calibration um, in the sequential adversarial setting. So we wanna figure out a way to make predictions where there's no distribution now. And we want that even if the examples that we need to make predictions about are being chosen by an adversary whose only goal is to make me look silly at the end of the class and like make sure that my predictions like were not in fact calibrated ex post. Remember, calibration in the sequential setting means we want that no matter what happens when I look at the empirical distribution over the observations that are that are realized ex post, um, we want to make it seem we, we want we want our predictions ex post to be calibrated on that empirical distribution. Okay, now. Um, we're we're going to be able to do this, and we've seen for marginal guarantees, like really dumb algorithms for for coming up with these marginal guarantees against an adversary. But I want you to be like I don't want that to make you think that all of this is easy. I, I want you to be suitably impressed when we are able to do this at the end. And so I'm going to ask Ricky for a, a war story. So, so this result um, that it's that it's even possible to get calibration in the adversarial setting is originally due to Dean Foster and Ricky Vora, who's sitting right there. And if I understand correctly, um, initially there was skepticism <laughs> that the result was true. Um, yeah, Aaron is correct. Uh, in, in, in the early presentations, people would not believe the theorem. And, uh, and I think vaguely, there was at least one referee report where we were rejected because the referee did not think the theorem could be true. Um, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want everyone to ooh and ah at the end. Okay, cool. So let's remember what we mean for when we say calibration in the sequential setting. Right, and you know, we're sort of in this class jumping back and forth repeatedly between the distributional setting and the sequential setting, and eventually we'll get it, but let me just remind you again for now. So in the sequential setting, time proceeds in rounds. Every day, first we see potentially like some features, then we have to make a prediction about what the label is going to be. Then we see the label. Okay. And this happens again and again and again. And these records accumulate in what we call a transcript, right? There's an entry for every day, features, prediction, label. 
Okay, and so this induces some empirical distribution after the fact, right? Like I take the uniform distribution over examples in this transcript. And what we want is that for any method of generating the transcript, well, the method of generating the transcript is really an interaction between two players, our algorithm, which we get to design, but then an arbitrary adversary who gets to sort of map partial transcripts to what they're going to do next. We want for any adversary that our, that our predictions should be calibrated uh, ex post on the transcript. So let's just write down a simple definition of, of what that means. Let's call this sequential mean, because we'll also talk about quantiles, calibration error. Okay. So first, let's fix the transcripts. I, uh, which is, remember, just a collection of records that are sort of, you know, feature vector I saw at day one, prediction I made at day one, label I saw at day one, all the way up through day T. So capital T is the length. Um, and we're going to think about algorithms that make discrete predictions. Uh, so predictions that are, you know, between zero and one on some grid so that it's going to be like sensible to condition on having predicted some value. Okay, so, um, okay, so in all of this, we're going to predict values P in what I'll call um, Use this notation one over m with brackets around it just to mean points on the discrete grid like, discretized at multiples of one over m. So zero, one over m, two over m, and so forth, all the way up to one. Okay, so that's the discrete grid. We're going to design algorithms that make predictions on this discrete grid. We can choose m. Um, and some notation for each prediction that we might have made in this discrete grid, um, I want to write n pi n of pi and p to denote the number of times I made prediction p on this transcript. How frequently did I predict p? Okay, so this is just sum over all of the rounds from one to capital T of the indicator that the prediction I made at that round was P. Okay, so this is like the, the number of times, raw number of times I predicted P. Okay, so the calibration error um, that we're going to talk about, and I'll write it, it's going to be the analog of what we called K2 in the distributional setting. So this is sort of like the, the L2, like the squared error variant of calibration error. Of course, we also saw like L1 versions and L infinity versions, but the squared error version will be convenient for us here. Right, so, so let's remember what squared calibration error meant in the distributional setting and just translate that over into the sequential setting. In the distributional setting, it was the expectation over the prediction that we make of the sort of um, marginal mean consistency error conditional on that prediction. So it's the expectation if I drew a random prediction according to the frequency with which my predictor makes predictions of the difference between that prediction and the actual expectation of the label conditioned on that prediction. 
Okay, so I, I just want to translate that same definition here, except now like it's an empirical quantity over a, a sequence of t examples rather than an expectation over a distribution. So what is it? Well, it's supposed to be something like the expectation over the prediction that I make. So this is like, um, well, the sum over all of the predictions that I could make. So all of the predictions in this grid, one over M. Okay, and if it's an expectation, it should be for each of them, the probability that I make that prediction. Now, what is that in a sequential setting? Uh, if, I'm, if I'm looking at the uniform distribution over the transcript, well, it's just the number of times that I made this particular prediction P divided by T. This is like the probability that I predict P if I'm selecting uniformly at random a point on the transcript. Okay, and then, um, you know, like, so, so this is the expectation part. And now I want the squared mean consistency error. So I want the difference between the prediction that I made and the, um, the average value of the label conditional on my prediction squared. So what is that uh, in the sequential setting? Well, I'll just sum over all of the days, but I really only want to sum over all of the days for which I made this prediction P. So sum over all of the days of the indicator that the prediction that I made was P. Okay, this will just zero out any other day. And the thing that I want to sum over that subset of days is just the difference between the label and the prediction that I made. Um, okay, so this is the sum over all of the days for which I made prediction P of the difference between the label and my prediction. I don't want the sum, I want the average. So I'm going to divide this by the number of days that I made prediction P, and I, you know, I'm looking, this is like the L2 variant, so I'm looking at the squared, I'm looking at this squared, right? This is um, the squared difference between my prediction and the label uh, on those days for which I made prediction P. Okay, so this is, this is our definition, um, and, and it's, it's exactly translating over our sort of batch distributional definition um, where, you know, everything here is just sort of the, you know, where previously there were expectations, you know, these, we're just evaluating those expectations on this, uh, on this uniform distribution over the days of the transcript. So is that clear? This is, this is not really like a new definition. I'm just writing our old definition in the sort of the language of, of the sequential prediction set. But does that make sense? Like is the, hopefully the definition is not too puzzling. Okay, and I want to um, note that if we're happy with this definition, if this is, if it's clear that this is like a direct translation of what we've been talking about already, you know, it's very tempting to simplify it a little bit because we've got the number of times, uh, you know, the we predicted P up here and we've also got it down here. And so this is, you're writing it this way is, is the direct translation, but like, there's a, we, we can simplify terms in a way that'll make it a little easier to work with. Okay, so, um, you know, we've got a you know, number of times we predicted P in the numerator. We've got number of times we predicted P squared in the denominator, we can cancel one of them. Okay, so this is the same thing. Oh, and we might as well bring this one over T to the outside. So this is the same thing as one over T at times the sum over all of the predictions that we might've made of the sum over all time of the indicator that we predicted P times the difference between the actual realized label and our prediction, um, divided by the square root of the number of times we predicted P. 
all of this squared. Okay, and so, so all I've done is I've brought the one over T to the outside and I've canceled exactly one of the, you know, number of times we predicted T terms from the numerator and the denominator. Okay, so if you were happy with this definition, because it was the same definition we were using in the batch setting, you should be equally happy with this definition. And this one's a little more convenient because it's just the average over a bunch of terms. We don't have to worry about this part. Okay, cool. Okay. So, um, good. So, so let's maybe develop a little more notation to talk about transcripts because remember what's the exercise we're going to go through now as we as we develop an algorithm to be calibrated um, against an adversary like we're going to be playing this game against an adversary sequentially and so at some intermediate moment in this game like part of the transcript has been uh you know fixed already like everything that happened from day one through yesterday and what I, as the algorithm, need to do is, as a function of the part of the transcript that's been fixed already, I need to figure out what to do tomorrow. So I want to figure. I want to. I want some notation to talk about partial transcripts, in particular the transcript up through yesterday, and sort of possible continuations of the transcripts, not necessarily actual continuations, but like possible continuations. So I want let, sort of notation to think about. Okay, what if, you know. This, this hypothetical thing was realized at round T together with everything I know was realized before round T. Okay, so let's see. Some transcript notation. Mm. Right, so given a transcript pi, We'll write pi less than t for the prefix of the transcript up through round t. Up sort of up through, but not including round t. So through round t minus one. So up through x t minus one. Pt minus one, yt minus one. Um, and then given a possible continuation of the transcript, let's say. Yeah, x hat t, p hat t, y hat t. Um, I'll write i less than t circle the, the possible continuation. To denote sort of the length little t transcript that would result from continuing the transcript for one round with this continuation. And if this hypothetical continuation is what was actually realized, so if, um, you know, x hat t, p hat t, y hat t, like actually equals xt, pt, yt, then this is equal to, uh, you know, x less than t plus one, sorry, pi less than t plus one, which maybe sometimes I'll just write as pi less than or equal to t. Okay, so, so we can think about hypothetical continuations, but like one of them is the real continuation, at which point we just get, uh, you know, like the prefix of the transcript that's one longer. Okay, makes sense. 
Okay. Um, so let's stare at the, the definition of, of calibration error for a moment and note, right, that it's the sum of like M plus one terms. So it's, there's like just a term corresponding to um, each prediction that we might make. And uh, when we extend the transcript, right, like, you know, when we extend the transcript by one time step, we will be changing exactly one of these M plus one terms because we will make a particular prediction. And, you know, these terms sort of are summing up over disjoint sets, right, like sort of uh, based on what prediction I make. So I will, oh, this is the sum over M plus one terms, but when I make a prediction and extend the transcript by one, I'm going to be changing exactly one of these terms. So it's going to be helpful for us to have some notation that just refers to like the term corresponding to some particular prediction at some particular time step. And then we can think about how these terms evolve. Okay. So, um, fixing a transcript. I, um, a time S, which could be any time index from one through T, uh, and a particular prediction, a particular prediction, which could be any one of our M plus one discrete predictions that we're thinking about. Um, let's define this quantity. I'll call it V sub S. Yeah, so indexed by S at the bottom, P at the top, and taking as input a transcript. This is just going to be um, the term corresponding to prediction P, uh, but like the, just the part inside the square. Okay, so this is going to be defined to be the sum over all of the time steps, not from one to capital T, just from one to S, because this is representing the value of that term at time S of um, the indicator that the prediction was P times the difference between the outcome and the prediction over the square root of the number of times that that prediction has been made um, on this transcript up through and including time s. Okay, so like this thing, right, you should recognize that it's just the term correspond, you know, it's the, it's the term from our calibration error corresponding to prediction p at time s, uh, but like we haven't taken the square of it. So this thing could be positive or it could be negative. It's positive if we were systematically um, under predicting, it's, it's negative if we were systematically over predicting. Okay. And it will be useful to note um, going forward, just like the, the sort of maximum and minimum scale of this thing, right? So this could be a positive number, it could be a negative number, but like how big can it be, right? Like in the numerator, like in the worst case, um, right, right? So first of all, like how many non-zero terms are there in the numerator? Well, you know, every non-zero term corresponds to a day to, in which we predicted P. Right, so the number of non-zero terms in the numerator is at most uh, the number of times we predicted p. Okay, and each of those non-zero terms can have magnitude at most one. Right, it could be positive or negative, but it can't be bigger than one. It can't be smaller than negative one. Okay, and, and then we're dividing by the number of times we predicted p. Sorry, the the square root of the number of times we predicted p. So uh, we always have, you know, for all transcripts for all 
predictions for all time steps, that if we look at the absolute value of this quantity, it can never be larger than the square root of the number of times we predicted P, right? Because the numerator is at most the number of times we predicted P, and then we're you know, in absolute value and we're dividing by the square root of that. Okay. Um, you know, generally, we'd expect it to be like a lot less than that. Uh, yeah, you know, they can't all be this big, but um, you know, this is like some coarse upper bound. Okay. So, um, okay. So, so, what have we done so far? Right. We've we've just like defined calibration error, and we've defined some notation to sort of talk about the calibration error in, in sort of finer grained detail. We can now talk about particular terms. Um, let's maybe think about, as we decide what we wanna do next, how we might go about designing an algorithm that would guarantee that calibration error was small for the transcript generated, no matter how the adversary was gonna generate his or her part of the transcript, right? Like what's happening? We're interacting with this adversary, right? Every day they pick a label, we pick a prediction, and then some term is added, you know, a new term is added to this calibration error. And the thing we're trying to promise is that, you know, in the worst case, as, as time proceeds, this quantity doesn't grow too large. Okay. Now it's a little bit hard to think about erase it. So you could think about this, and, and there's sort of a a slick non-constructive proof of the thing I'm going to prove to you constructively that sort of says, oh, you have a question. Yeah. So if there's the prediction and then adversary gives the true label. Uh, the, the, you should think about the algorithm coming up with the prediction simultaneously with the adversary coming up with the label. The adversary is not allowed to look at your prediction before coming up with the label. Because otherwise, if I predicted more than a 50% chance of rain, they would say it didn't rain and, and vice versa. So it is important that like the adversary can base the outcome on everything that happened up through day T minus one, but they cannot base the outcome based on what I'm saying today. So think about it as like a simultaneous move game. I pick a prediction, the adversary picks a, um, picks a uh, label at every round. Um, okay, so so like thinking about it, by the way, as like a you know this sort of simultaneous move game where um, you know the adversary is um, trying to like maximize this quantity and I'm trying to minimize it, it is actually like a an interesting way to think about this. And there's a really slick you know like one page proof of the existence of an algorithm of the sort that I'm gonna show you. This is a non-constructive proof, I think originally due to Sergio Hart, um, that just takes that perspective. It says, look, it's, it's like a big zero sum game. You know, it's, it's really big, but it's finite because, you know, like the prediction space is finite. What is an algorithm? Well, it's nothing but a mapping from transcripts to predictions. There's only finitely many transcripts. Um, you know, right? So, so it's a some in you know, inhumanly large zero sum game, but it's like finite, and um, you know, like there's for every transcript, there's like oh right, right, and so like right. The, so the learner's strategy space is the set of all algorithms. The way we've set it up, there's only finitely many. The adversary's strategy space is also the set of all algorithms mapping transcripts to labels. Again, there's a lot, but like finitely many. Um, Every transcript corresponds to like a number, like its calibration score. We, I, you know, we would like to minimize the expected calibration score. The adversary would like to maximize the expected calibration score. And so you can apply the minimax theorem and you can like analyze what happens like instead of, uh, I've gone a brief tangent here, apologies for those of you who don't know what the minimax theorem is. This will be much more interesting for those of you who do, I'll tell you what it is later in the class, but it won't be relevant for the rest of the lecture. Uh, but permit me for the next, you know, two minutes. Um, you know, I'll just tell you briefly. So, so like, 
you guys all know what zero sum games are because you've played rock, paper, scissors, right? Like rock, paper, scissors. Um, it's a zero sum game because my opponent wants exactly the opposite of what I do. Wants me to, uh, you yeah, know, he wants me to lose, I want me to win. The magical fact about zero sum games, like the one thing you should know about zero sum games, which is called von Neumann's min max theorem, is that it doesn't matter who goes first if you want to figure out how well I can do in the game, right? So long as I'm allowed to randomize, right? So ordinarily, you might think if I'm forced to tell you my strategy and you get to best respond to it, that would be a disadvantage. But it's not so in rock, paper, scissors, right? Like I could say, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to like randomize, you know, uniformly between rock and paper and scissors and like, you know, rats. Like you, <laughs> you can't like exploit me based on that. And, and so it doesn't matter who goes first. So in this view of what's going on here as a zero sum game, what's really happening is the learner is going first. They have to commit to an algorithm and the adversary gets to choose the sequence with knowledge of the algorithm. Okay, that's why it seems hard to like design such a thing. But because it's a zero sum game, you could, when trying to think about how well the learner could do, imagine that the adversary had to go first. Right? If the adversary, if the adversary goes first, then you know ahead of time exactly what, you know, they might be randomizing, but you know what the expected value of the label is every day because it's like every day they've told you the, dis the label distribution. That's what it means that they go first. And if they did that, it would be very easy to be calibrated. You would just predict the mean of the label distribution. That's all you're trying to do. And so, right, right, like if you, right, in the world where the adversary goes first, this is like not only putting you back in the distributional setting that we know and love, uh, it's putting you in the distributional setting where you, where you know the distribution. There's nothing to learn. You just predict the mean. And so if the adversary goes first, okay, it's a little algebra required to make sure you can make this particular quantity small, but it's like intuitive that you can. And the fact that it's a zero sum game means you can apply the min-max theorem and conclude like magically and non-constructively that there's an algorithm that does just as well, even if, even if the learner has to go first, which means does just as well against any possible adversary simultaneously. Now this is non-constructive because the zero sum game we described here is like, ridiculously huge. <laughs> the, the strategy space is the set of all algorithms that could map transcripts of length less than capital T, of which there are exponentially many in T, to outcomes. So there's no hope of like directly solving that zero sum game. Uh, and, um, you know, this is only an existential proof. Okay, but, um, but we're going to give a constructive proof. And if, if, this discussion confused you because you didn't know what the min-max theorem is or what zero-sum games are, you can wash it from your minds now. We're going to continue from where we left off. Okay. So, um, right, so, so like, what's the difficulty in this sort of line of thought of thinking about this as like a giant game? It's the fact that like, there's just so inhumanly many things you could do if I think of the algorithm design space as like mapping all possible histories to what I'm going to do next. And so what we're going to try to do is take a much more myopic strategy and like hope it works. Okay. And then we'll be like gratified when at the end of the lecture it does work. So rather than trying to optimize over like all possible algorithms, we're going to take like a greedy approach. We're going to say, look, what's done is done. Like, you know, mistakes might have been made, but like here I am at day little t. I just have to figure out what to do tomorrow. And my goal is to like do the thing tomorrow that will cause the one step increase in my calibration loss to be as small as possible. So I'm thinking only one step ahead. There's no guarantee this is going to work, right? It might be that, you know, in, in all sorts of settings, the right thing to do is not to think only one step ahead is to think, you know, like maybe I should like take a big hit tomorrow so that things work out better later. We're going to do something that might be dumb. We're going to myopically optimize to just try to keep tomorrow's calibration loss as small as possible. Um, but of course, if we can do that, then, then, then that's great. Because if I can every day keep the increase in calibration loss small, then summing up over all of the days, the total calibration loss is small. 
So that's what we're going to do until we finish. You know, you shouldn't be convinced this is going to work because generally behaving myopically like is not optimal, but like in this case, we're going to get lucky. Okay. And so like in particular, if what we're going to do is we're going to think about how to minimize the, the one-step increase in calibration loss, I want to really understand well what the one-step increase in calibration loss is as a function of a one-step continuation of the transcript. Okay. So let's fix any partial transcript. Um, so a record of what happened up through day S. Okay. And any continuation and any potential continuation for what might happen at the next day. And let's just pretend that that does happen. So let's say that pi, um, you know, the transcript up through round S plus one, like actually is the transcript up through round S concatenated with, you know, this potential outcome. Okay, we don't know if that's what's gonna happen, but let's pretend for a moment that it is what's gonna happen. And so, now, I want to say, I want to define this quantity, delta S plus one, as a function of this potential continuation. Okay, as a function of the prediction that I would make tomorrow in this continuation and the outcome that would be realized tomorrow in this continuation. I'll ignore X's because since we're only dealing with regular calibration at the moment, the X's are actually irrelevant. They don't show up anywhere here. Okay. And what is this quantity? Well, this is just, well, the one step increase in calibration error if PS plus one and YS plus one really are realized tomorrow. So this is just the difference between the calibration error um, as evaluated on this hypothetical transcript that would arise tomorrow if these were the if these were the outcomes, minus the calibration error on today's transcript. Okay, so this is like the one step increase. And the thing that I want to try to do is to design an algorithm that's going to promise, you know, I get to pick P, but I don't get to pick Y. So I want to come up with a strategy for P's such that no matter what Y is, this thing is small. In particular, I want to understand this quantity. I want to upper bound it. Okay, so that I, if I can get a handle on it, then maybe I can think about how to minimize it. So the lemma we're the first lemma we're going to prove is that you know for any transcript, for any continuation, uh, for any time step. When I look at this quantity, the one step increase in my calibration error as a function of what I do tomorrow and as a function of what the adversary does tomorrow. So this is always upper bounded by one over T times twice the cumulative, sort of the, the calibration error um, term for the prediction that I make tomorrow as evaluated on my transcript today over the square root of the number of times that as of today, I've already made that prediction. So 
that I might hypothetically make tomorrow. Okay, this is this thing here, right? Here we are at day S. This thing here is just some constant. Like this is defined already today. This is a number because the transcript, uh, this is defined entirely in terms of quantities that have already been realized because we're looking at the transcript up through day S. So that's a number. Okay, well, what about what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, it's this number times the difference between tomorrow's label and tomorrow's prediction. Okay, this part depends on uh, this part depends on what happens tomorrow. So it's some constant that's defined today times this linear term in in what's going to happen tomorrow plus one over the number of times that up through today I've already played uh, the thing that I'm going to predict tomorrow. Okay, so that's what I want to prove first, right? It's, it's just a, you know, trying to make like it's sort of clear why what we want to do, I think, is come up with an algorithm to choose what P to pick so that no matter what Y is chosen, we don't know what Y is going to be chosen by the adversary, so that this thing is small. The one round increase in calibration error is small. It's hard to think about this. So the first step is to like upper bound it by something tractable. You know, hopefully this thing is tractable, but let's um, let, let's prove this. And just to give you some sense for why this might be tractable, you know, right? It looks like there's some confusing terms here. Remember, this is just a number. This is just some constant. The only part that really depends in any relevant way on the thing I don't have control over, the thing the adversary is going to choose tomorrow, is this term. And this term is very simple. It's just the difference between what the adversary is going to do tomorrow and what I'm going to do tomorrow. Okay. That's the, yeah, we have to prove the lemma, but are there questions about why we're proving this lemma? Okay. Okay, so unfortunately, I just I just um, erased the definition of calibration error, which would have been really handy to point to at the moment. But let me just you know I'm sure you guys all remember it. So, so remember, um, what was calibration error? It was just we, we we arranged things so that it was just the sum over m plus one terms, one for each prediction we could make, um, and each of those terms sort of referred only to the days for which we made a particular prediction. So if tomorrow we make some particular prediction P, only one of those terms is going to change, right? Like each of these calibration error terms, it's the sum over M plus one terms, one for each prediction we might make. But for M of them, those terms are going to be the same tomorrow and today. The only term that's going to change was the one that was sort of accumulating uh, a record of what happened on days when we played the thing that we played tomorrow. Okay, so first off, in this in this difference, um, everything cancels out except for the term corresponding to days on which we made the particular prediction p of s plus one. Right, so we want to bound the difference between the calibration error tomorrow and the calibration error today. Is 
this is the sum over a bunch of terms, one for each prediction we could make, but they all, all those terms cancel except for the one corresponding to the prediction that we actually made tomorrow. So this difference is not a sum of over m plus one terms, it's just the difference for that one term. What's that one term? Well, it's one over t times, what was that term? Uh, you know, what, what's that term going to be tomorrow? Well, it's the sum over all of the days through s plus one, because tomorrow there will have been s plus one days of the indicator that the prediction that we made was p s plus one. This is the the term that doesn't cancel, the one corresponding to days for which we predicted p s plus one of the difference between the actual outcome and the prediction divided by the square root of the number of times that on tomorrow's transcript we played PS plus one. Okay. squared. This is just the sort of the term in the sum defining calibration error for the prediction PS plus one tomorrow. Okay. What we need to subtract off from that is the same term in the sum, but on today's transcript rather than tomorrow's transcript. Um, S plus one. Mm, where? Um, oh, you're you're complaining about the normalization term. This is the one over T. Yeah. yeah. So, so I guess, right, maybe let's think about, um, let, let's say we know ahead of time that it's going to be length t, and so everything's normalized uh, by 1 over t. So I think this is the number I want to analyze, but you're right, it's not quite how I defined uh, calibration error. But But still, if I can, you know, if all of these are always normalized by capital T, they're still accumulating. And if I can bound the change, then I will bound the calibration error at the end. But good point. Good question. Other questions? Okay. So this is sort of the term corresponding to the, you know, bucket PS plus one today. So, sorry, tomorrow. I need to subtract off the term corresponding to bucket PS plus one today. And that's just the sum over all of the days now, not through S plus one, but through S of the indicator that the prediction was P S plus one uh, times Y T minus P T now divided by the square root of the number of times that on today's transcript, I played prediction PS plus one, this squared. Okay. Okay, so like, what are the what, what's what's different between these two terms? Well, there's two things, right? Like, um, the sum in the numerator here has like one extra term, um, but then like annoyingly, the denominator is also different, right? Because we're dividing, on the one hand, by the number of times we played p s plus one, you know, up through tomorrow, and on you know, the other hand, the number of times we played PS1 up through today. Now we know the relationship between these, like 
since tomorrow in the, you know, premised on all of this is that tomorrow we've played PS plus one, you know, the number of times we've played PS plus one tomorrow is one more than the number of times we played it today. Um, so it would be more convenient for us if these were the same denominator. Okay. And so suppose instead I divided by the square root of the number of times I played PS plus one through today in the first term rather than through tomorrow. I would be dividing by a smaller number. Uh, this quantity is squared, so it's always going to be positive. So if I divide by a smaller number, I'll only make this whole expression bigger. Okay, so you know the change in calibration error from today to tomorrow is exactly equal to this, but if I'm happy upper bounding it, then it's okay if I divide by a slightly smaller number in the first term that only makes the first term uh, bigger. It also solves the normalization problem. Uh, yeah, good. Um, okay. Okay, so let's think about this quantity. Now we should remember that this complicated thing here, uh, we've given it a name. Okay, so if we use the name we've given it, the expression will be somewhat simpler. Let's do that. So this is just what we called um, V S. PS plus one evaluated on the transcript up through today. Um, well, V, S, P actually only accounts for the first S terms in this sum. Actually, on the you know, in the first term we have S plus one terms. So we need to take into account the extra term as well. So it's it's this sort of record we have for bucket PS plus one, uh, plus like the extra term we didn't account for, which is uh, the difference between YS plus one minus PS plus one divided by the square root of the number of times up through today, we played PS plus one, okay? All of this squared, that's the first term. All we've done is we've observed that this complicated thing is just, you know, a quantity we'd given a name to, uh, plus like the one extra term that wasn't accounted for in that quantity. And then this term is actually exactly the quantity we gave the name to, right? So minus, um, just V S P S plus one evaluated on the transcript up through today squared. Okay. We've just used the name that we came up with. And now we can start canceling things because, you know, like what's a plus B squared is like a squared plus two a B plus b squared. And so like, we've got an a squared here, we've got a minus a squared here, they're gonna, they're gonna cancel out. So what's this? Just canceling terms, you know, the, the vs squared term cancels. And what we're left with is just the cross terms. What are the, you know, what's the cross term? Well, we've got Two times V S V S plus one. I'll stop writing the dependence on the transcript. Um, times Y S plus one minus P S plus one 
over the square root of the number of times up through today that we've played PS plus one. Okay, that's the sort of cross term. And then there's just sort of this term squared, which is ys plus one minus ps plus one over no, squared over the number of times that we've played ps plus one. And now we've got something in the form that we want. Okay, we can just write it a little bit differently separating out the things that are constants as of today from the things that are not. So this is just one over T times two VS PS plus one over the square root of the number of times up through today that we've played PS plus one. Okay, that's all a constant times the difference between tomorrow's label and tomorrow's prediction. That's not a constant. It depends on what happens tomorrow, but it's linear. So it's, it's, it's sort of the kind of thing we might hope to be able to deal with. And this thing looks complicated, but it's small. So I don't know what the, you know, the square of things is, but you know, if, if it's the difference between two numbers that are at most one, well, the square is also at most one. So this is at most one over the number of times up through today, we've played prediction S plus one, which is what we wanted to prove. Okay. So, okay, so we're like, Halfway there, why don't we take this moment to take, you know, like a 15 minute break to stretch, and then we'll come back and we'll use this lemma to derive an algorithm that'll guarantee calibration. Um, is one over T, is that the same as one over S or is T and S, are these uh, Let's just, let's for now say that they're different. S is where we are sort of in the transcript Today, we, you know, so we could be on we could be on the first day or the second day or the third day. S will denote where we are today. T is where we're going. So, so the total length of the transcript is going to be T. But then T, so going back to like the, the normalized thing, then T is always larger than any given S. So the one over T is. Yeah, let's just, you know, maybe I should, when I was defining these things, I should have just left out the normalization. So maybe like just pretend that this whole one over T thing is not there. Like if I had defined calibration error in an unnormalized fashion, not dividing by T, then the one over T wouldn't be there and all of these calculations would look more correct to you. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like the less than or equal, I felt okay with that because I thought we were going from one over S plus one to one over S in that first. We are. But if it's one over equal. So we are going from something like one over S plus one to one over S here. Yeah. Like the, the T is, the T is not interacting with any of this. It's just, yeah, yeah. The, the T is, yeah, yeah, yeah. The T is just floating there at the at the beginning. If you want, we're dealing with unnormalized calibration error, and then we're just going to divide by T at the end. Okay, so we're trying to calibrate against an adversary. And we've just proved this useful lemma that says that, you know, given stuff that's already happened, which defines this number, it's the number at this point, that if tomorrow I predict PS plus one and the adversary comes back 
and you know gives me label ys plus one then the change in my calibration error the one step change in my calibration error uh, is going to be this thing some constant times tomorrow's label minus tomorrow's prediction plus some number that's kind of small okay um and our goal is to come up with a, a strategy for predicting that gets to look at what's happened so far and so in particular can look at you know these numbers and come up with a strategy so that no matter what ys plus one is because we don't know what that is this thing will be small okay now i want to think about this two ways the first way just for fun because i mentioned this minimax thing already and then the second way you know the actual thing we're going to do so suppose the adversary told us what they were going to do first suppose the adversary um went first right um so it you know in particular we knew not exactly what they were going to play tomorrow because you know they might randomize but the distribution of what they were going to play tomorrow so in particular um you know if I, I could think about the expectation of this quantity as a function of the thing i'm going to play tomorrow what's that well again this thing's just a number doesn't depend on what they do this thing's just a number doesn't depend on what they do um and so like this expectation over what they're going to do it just comes through here right right like the, this the dependence on what they're going to do is linear okay so the expectation of this quantity would just be you know this number times the expected value of the label they're going to play minus the thing i play um plus another number so if they went first there'd clearly be something i could do that would make this uh, change in calibration loss small what would i do I would play the expected value of their label distribution that would zero out this term right this term would come out to be zero and the expected change in calibration loss would be just this small number at the end okay so that's sort of how you know, some version of the minimax argument you know that's how well I could do if they if the adversary committed ahead of time um and, and told me their distribution I would just predict the expected value of their distribution and because this bound we proved on the change in calibration error is linear in their action it means i just match their expectation and i'm done okay well actually you know one little nuance is that i'm predicting over this discrete grid discretized at one over m so maybe i can't exactly match their expectation but i can get within one over m okay that's if they were going first now in fact they're not going first so like that's that, that does not correspond to a strategy right the strategy cannot be predict the expected value of the label tomorrow because i don't know what that is right i, I don't know what this is um but like think about the form of the strategy right like the change in calibration loss is like the product of these two terms and if i knew what the adversary was doing what i would do is i would play to make the second term equal to zero or as close to zero as possible I can't do that, but it's the product of these two terms. And the first term, although it's a constant, it depends on my action. The it, I get to choose this constant because it's a constant that's indexed by my action. And so what I could try to do is I could try to play so as to make in expectation the first term zero. That would be just as good. And so that's the algorithm. That's going to be the algorithm. I'm going to try to play every day to make this first term zero in expectation so that this whole thing is small no matter what the adversary does okay some details to work out but that's the that's the idea okay and let's just notationally sort of you know this change in calibration error it's it's which we call delta you know it was this thing where all the action is plus this like little term at the end that we're going to have to deal with but it's somehow less interesting so let me give a name to this first term where all the action is let me just call that delta one and i'm going to spend some time bounding delta one and then we'll deal with this thing separately question before we dive into like some derivations uh, questions about the strategy or or you know what i just said uh Oops. 
but if this is linear, I know this is not linear in reality, but the, the bound is linear. Doesn't it imply that we don't want to match the expectation, rather we want to have as high deviation as possible because it's linear? Um, so remember that this thing could be positive or negative. So we don't necessarily want to make this as negative as possible, for example, because it could be that, right, like if I wanted to make this as negative as possible, what would I do? I would pre predict, you know, P is one. But it might be that this V term for P is one is very negative, which would be the opposite of what I want. So, so this is like a constant that depends on my action, but um, you know, I don't understand much about what this constant is. It could be positive or negative. And so if I pick a P that makes this zero, I don't care what this term is, but I, I can't, if I try to do more clever things, you know, it might turn out that my more clever things correspond to very counterproductive things if the sign of this is not what I'm expecting. But the fact that these signs can be positive or negative is exactly what we're going to exploit to come up with an algorithm that guarantees that the first term is zero in expectation. Good question. Other questions? Okay. So, what I want to do is I want to write down a strategy a prediction strategy, so a distribution over predictions that I will make tomorrow as a function of everything that's happened up through today that will guarantee that in expectation, this first term, this interesting term is small, no matter what the outcome is tomorrow. Okay, so let's write it down. So let's fix any transcript up through today. So fix any i less than or equal to s. And in particular, what does that fix? That fixes all of these numbers here. Like I know what this number is once I fix the transcript. Okay. And now I'm gonna define a distribution. over predictions. Okay, there's gonna be a few cases. So it might be that V1, remember sort of the portion of the calibration error corresponding to the, the largest possible prediction, the prediction uh, that P equals one. It might be that this is non-negative, okay? In that case, um, you know, there's no distribution. I'm just gonna deterministically predict that the outcome is gonna be one. And that's like a pretty sensible prediction, right? Because like, let's think about V1, right? Like um, V1 can't possibly be positive, right? Because the labels are between zero and one. And in V1, the prediction is always one. So if this is non-negative, that means that so far, every single day, the label's been one. So yeah, every day so far, the label's been one. Uh, why don't we predict one? That seems like a pretty good idea. That's what we're gonna do. Similarly, if the calibration error uh, corresponding to the prediction of zero is non-positive, We'll predict zero. Again, the calibration error corresponding to a prediction of zero um, can't possibly be positive because the labels are between zero and one. And if we always predict zero, these terms are at least zero. So 
if this thing um, if this thing is uh, non-positive, that means every single day so far, the realized label has been zero. And so it's a pretty sensible thing to predict that it's going to be zero again. Okay, so, so far the algorithm is doing sensible things, but really these first two cases have only handled what you would expect are sort of extremely narrow corner cases. If every day we've seen a one so far, or if every day we've seen a zero so far. So really we expect that, you know, like neither of these will be the case. Okay. So, okay. So, so how about, um, what, what's the other case? So in the other case, um, I guess V0 is positive and V1 is negative. Okay. Which means if I start at V0 and start walking towards V1, stepping on one of the Vs each time, at some point I will have my left foot on a negative number and my right foot on a positive number. Okay, there'll be two adjacent um, buckets that have opposite sign. So in the remaining case, it's well defined that we can find a prediction E such that our calibration error so far on P is greater than zero. Our calibration, our calibration error um, so far on the next prediction up, which is P plus one over M, um, is less than zero, right? My left foot's on a positive number, my right foot's on a negative number. And um, if I've got a positive number and a negative number, then there's always a way to randomize between them so that an expectation, I get zero, right? So in that case, I'll do that. So I'll find Q, a randomization parameter, such that if I pick prediction P with probability Q, and I pick prediction P plus one over M with probability one minus Q, then when I look at the expected value of V, you know, the calibration error for P over the square root of the number of times P has been played, okay, which is just, well, um, Q times, the calibration error for P over the square root of times the number of P has been played, Q is the probability that I play P plus one minus Q, which is gonna be the probability that I play a P plus one over M of the corresponding calibration error for the prediction P plus one over M. divided by the square root of the number of times I've played P plus one over M. That this expectation is equal to zero. And um, my strategy in this case is predict tomorrow P with probability Q and predict E plus one over M with probability one minus Q. Okay, so I okay, haven't made a statement yet about what the lemma is claiming, but I've defined a probability distribution. I just wanna make sure it makes sense to everybody. 
So it sort of first is handling two corner cases. It's like, all right, if everything we've seen so far is a one, let's predict one. If everything we've seen so far is a zero, let's predict zero. We don't really expect either of those to be the case, but the point is, um, if those aren't the case, then V1 uh, is negative and V0 is positive. Okay, which means I can find an adjacent pair of predictions, P and P plus one over M, such that the calibration error on the first one is positive and the calibration on the second one is negative. Otherwise, I'd have to be in one of the first two corner cases. Okay, which means this number here is positive and this number here is negative. So we're dividing by a non-negative thing, which means it's possible to randomize between these two so that the expectation is zero. Let Q be the probability that corresponds to that randomization. And our strategy is going to be to predict P with probability Q and P plus one over M with probability one over Q, with probability one minus Q. Okay, so, so we're randomizing, but just a little bit. Like, you know, think of M as big. So we're, we're you know, basically predicting probability P. We're just sort of jiggling our prediction around randomly by sort of one over M. Okay. Then the claim is that yes. Like return Vs prime by greater than s, can it actually be positive or would it just be zero? It can't be positive. It would be like the only way this can be satisfied, the only way either of these can be satisfied is if they're exactly zero. So can the third case subsume those cases? Like would it um because in the third case you're still you could still find that point, right? Yeah, I guess you're right. You you only really need um the third case. Uh, in that, and sort of the third case would correspond, like the third case would recover the first two cases. Like if if um, the prediction had always been one, uh, or if the prediction had always been zero, you would just do this. Uh, yeah, so, so it's, you know, it's really all the third case, but if the prediction's always been one, or if the prediction's always been zero, you don't randomize at all, and otherwise you do. Is that gonna end up being like important in the analysis? Um, the analysis will break into these three cases, but I guess, you know, as you say, I guess probably I could just analyze the third case. Um, so yeah, maybe it's not so important. Yeah, you get slightly better bounds in the first two cases, but, um, they're never going to happen. So yeah, maybe, maybe I should have just done the third case. Okay. So what's the claim? Um, the claim is if, you know, if you play according to this strategy, then if I look at the expectation or, or, you know, for all labels that might be realized tomorrow, it's important that I make a claim quantified over all possible labels because I don't know what tomorrow's label is going to be, right? I get to control the prediction, but not the label. The claim is for all labels that might occur tomorrow, if I look at the expectation over the thing that I do control, which is the prediction I'm going to make tomorrow, according to this distribution, which is not much of a distribution. In the first two cases, it's deterministic. In the third case, it's randomized, but just by wiggling over, you know, prediction P versus P plus one over M. And I look at the expected value of uh, this increase in calibration loss, in particular, this interesting term that I call delta one here. And the sort of expected interesting part of the increase tomorrow, given the prediction that I play and the label that's realized, where the expectation is over the choice of prediction, but universally quantified over uh, the realized label, this is going to be less than 2 over Tm. Okay. So that's the claim. Okay. 
So let's first consider cases one and two. We can consider them together because they're very similar. Um, so what is this thing, delta s plus one of e s plus one, y s plus one? Well, uh, it's one over t times v s p s plus one over something the number of times we've played p s plus one times y s plus one minus p s plus one. Okay, so let's consider cases one and two. So in case one, this is a positive number. And we predict one. So this must be either zero or a negative number. Okay. In case two, this is a negative number, uh, but we predict zero, so this must be either zero or a positive number. So in either case, um, you know, we're trying to prove this thing is less than two over TM. We did even better. It's less than zero. Okay. So, um, Yeah, so, so what's the remaining case? Um, it's case three. Okay, and so first, you know, I just want to again observe that case three is, is sort of well defined, right? Like, because for my lowest prediction, the calibration error is negative, and for my highest prediction, the calibration error, or sorry, for my lowest prediction, the calibration error is positive. For my highest prediction, the calibration error is negative. There must be at some intermediate point a value p for which the calibration error for p is positive and the calibration error for p plus one over m is negative. So I've got to somehow get from positive to negative at some point. Okay. And so, like, this is not, but like, this is well defined. There is at least one p satisfying this. And, and so, this is a like a distribution that I can actually sample from. Okay, so in that case, um, what is you know now there really is an expectation. What is the expectation over my choice of p? Of this term. Well, you know, I can just write out this expectation explicitly because the distribution is pretty simple. With probability Q, I'm going to play P. And with probability 1 minus Q, I'm going to play, play P plus 1 over M. So, well, um, Okay. With probability um, Q, what happens? Well, the change in my calibration error will be two times VSP over the number of times I've played P uh, because I played P and That'll be multiplied by tomorrow's label minus p. Okay, that's just, you know, like the, it's just the change in calibration error when I play p, which occurs with probability q. Um, and with probability one minus q, uh, 
I'll play P plus one over M. And so the change in calibration error will be two times Vs P plus one over M over square root of the number of times I've played P plus one over M times tomorrow's label minus tomorrow's prediction, which now is P plus one over M. So I subtract off P uh, minus one over M. Okay, so right, I, all I've done is I've said, okay, I've got an expression for the change in calibration error if I play P, I've got an expression for the change in calibration error if I play P plus one over M, and I do the first thing with probability Q, and I do the second thing with probability one minus Q, and so that's the change, right? Now, what do I know? Q was chosen so that Q times this thing plus one minus Q times this thing is equal to zero, right? That was how Q was chosen, right? So, you know, Q times this thing times a constant plus one minus Q times this thing times a constant is also equal to zero because zero times a constant is zero. So the thing that the first term is multiplied by is, you know, tomorrow's label minus P. The thing, the thing that the second term is multiplied by is annoyingly not the same number. It's tomorrow's label minus P minus one over M. But I can break this up into two things, right? Right, like first tomorrow's label minus P and then I'll handle the one over M separately. So except for the one over M, these two terms cancel out because Q was chosen so that they equal zero. Okay, so Right, because of the definition of Q, all that's left of this term is sort of the part corresponding to this minus one over M term. So this equals one over T times minus one over M, this thing, times this term, times what's left. Right, so minus one over M times one minus Q uh, times two times the calibration error so far on prediction P plus one over M over square root of the number of times we've played P plus one over M. Now remember, when we defined V, what was the thing that I stressed about how big it can be? Square root of the number of times we've played that prediction. So I don't know if this is positive or negative, um, but um, what I do know is that its magnitude is at most the Thing I'm dividing it by. Okay, so I'm upper bounding this. In the worst case, I guess, you know, since there's a negative sign here, it's negative. So this whole term is positive. And in the worst case, it takes its, you know, smallest possible value, which is minus square root of the number of times it's been played, in which case this whole thing evaluates to just minus two. And what I'm left with is uh, two over Tm which was the claim. Okay. Okay. So we're almost ready to give the final, you know, analysis of the algorithm. Um, let me just emphasize, rather than copying it all out again, that this is the algorithm. Right, like the algorithm is in the lemma. So we have a complete specification for our algorithm now. The thing that we claim is going to be calibrated against any adversary. What is it? 
it's just, you know, check, has the adversary always predicted one so far? If so, predict one. Has the adversary always predicted zero so far? If so, predict zero. Otherwise, find two adjacent predictions in our discrete grid, P and P plus one over M, such that we have historically positive calibration error for predicting P and negative calibration error for predicting P plus one over M. And then let's hedge by randomizing between these two adjacent things. And so sort of the chance that we increase our positive calibration error is kind of balanced out by the chance that we increase our negative calibration error, which would be helpful to us and vice versa, right? So like whatever the label is, it will make the calibration error worse in one of these buckets and better in the other one. And we're just going to randomize between them so that we can get the benefit either way, or at least we don't have to pay much cost either way. That's the algorithm. The algorithm is very simple to implement. Like it's just keeping track of some numbers, right? Like these are just like constants that you could like accumulate as you go. And then it's just like doing like a line of algebra. Okay, so is the algorithm clear, like well-defined? Yes. The third case. So the claim is that P is monotone in P. V doesn't have to be monotone in P. Um, all we need is that V1 is negative, or sorry. Yeah, V0 is positive and V2, V1 is negative. If we're in the third case, it must be the case, right? It doesn't have to be monotone. It could go up and down and up and down. But like, let's see. So this is called in computer science, a hybrid argument, but like, uh, it's very simple. So let's try to visualize it. So let's say that, um, okay. Positive numbers are red and negative numbers are blue. So V0 is red. And I've got, you know, I've got like, a, I'm standing on a stepping stone corresponding to V0. And all the way over there is V1, it's blue. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start walking on these stepping stones, 0, 1 over M, 2 over M, 3 over M. And I'm starting on a red stone. And by the time I get over here, I'm going to be on a blue stone. I don't know what the, it's not monotone. It might, you know, the pattern of stones could be arbitrary. All I'm claiming is that as I'm doing it, I must at some point have one foot on a red stone and one foot on a blue stone. Because if I never do that, I can't ever get to a blue stone. Do you buy it? I buy that, yeah. Yeah, so, so it, I don't know much about what these numbers look like at all. Like they're not necessarily monotone. I don't need them to be. Okay. Yeah, and maybe like the intuition for what the algorithm is doing, right? It's like really trying to like hedge its bets. It doesn't know what the adversary is doing, but you know, like so far, you know, when it looks at its performance so far, it's done like, you know, it's, it's systematically predicted too low in some places. It's systematically predicted too high in others. And what it's doing is it's picking like a place where no matter what the adversary plays, it's sort of equally likely to help it or hurt it. Yeah. For, for the purposes of this analysis, we don't choose any of them. Uh, you know, depending on what your application is and, you know, when we end up doing this for sort of quantiles and coming up with prediction intervals. You might separately want that your prediction intervals, um, you know, not just that they have the right coverage, but that they be as small as possible. And so then you'd want to pick the, the smallest such P. But if all we want is mean calibration, then, you know, any choice of P is going to work here. Other questions? So the, the algorithm is clear. Okay. Mm.
But the claim is against any adversary. Right, we fixed an algorithm for the learner. So once we fix a, an algorithm or a strategy for the adversary that induces a distribution over transcripts. Right, so fix an adversary, fix any adversary that induces some distribution over transcripts. And the claim is that, well, right, once I've fixed an adversary, it's sensible to talk about expectations over transcripts because I have a distribution over transcripts. If I look at in expectation over the interaction with the adversary, what my calibration error is going to be at the end of T rounds. So I'm now talking about the full length transcript at the end of T rounds. This is, or you know, let's maybe also fix a discretization parameter M. Okay, and then we'll want to choose this optimally. Um, my calibration error at the end of T rounds is going to be at most two over M plus M plus one over T times log of T over M plus one. Now, what should I make of this? Um, now, note that M is a parameter that I get to choose, right? So, so the claim here is that I'm going to bound my calibration loss by like the sum of two terms. The first one goes down with M. Bigger M is better for the first term. The second one goes up with M. Uh, bigger M is worse for the second term. But M isn't some like inherent like parameter of the problem. M is like a parameter of my algorithm. I should choose this to minimize the, these two terms. And so in particular, if I choose M to be, say, the square root of 2T um, over log T, this basically the parameter that equalizes these two terms, then what this comes out to is that my expected calibration error is at most a term that I can bound as log t over t. Okay, so my calibration error will go down sort of at the optimal rate at like one over root t, which is the best you could do for empirical calibration error, even if you knew what the distribution was and we're predicting the true means, right? Because, you know, this is sort of the same phenomena as if you were like flipping coins, even if I predict, you know, uh, 0.5 every day, you know, because it's a fair coin, what's the probability of heads? If I actually look at the difference between the empirical fraction of heads and 0.5, over t, t rounds, it'll be a number that goes to zero at the rate of one over root t. So the statement here is that even though there is no distribution, there's in fact an adversary who's trying to like screw us up, there's this like extremely simple algorithm that can guarantee that the calibration error goes to zero at a rate of one over root t. So I think the one is outside, outside of the log n. Uh, yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, right. So, so, okay. Like we haven't proved it yet, but like this is where you ooh and ah, right? Like this is the thing that when they, you know, like when you read like Ricky's paper and you're the reviewer, you say reject. Like this cannot possibly be true because it's saying like you you can get but like to an outside observer who's like looking at this transcript after the fact. It looks like you knew what the distribution was, at least through the lens of calibration error. This is the calibration error you would have gotten if you knew the distribution, right? But you didn't know the distribution. In fact, there was no distribution. You were playing a game 
against like a bad guy, right? That's why we call him an adversary, whose only goal was to make it, you know, make you look stupid when someone looked at the transcript afterwards. And this is saying that like, he can't do it, right? Like if you're, at least if you look at things through the lens of calibration error, it's gonna look like you knew what you were doing and you didn't, like you didn't know anything about the process that was generating the outcomes. Okay, so this is why you reject Ricky's paper, right? Well, you reject, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't around then. Okay, um, let's prove it. So, um, okay. So fix any transcript. Of length T. Okay, so this is just a record of X1, P1, Y1, up through XT, PT, YT. And observe, obviously, that if I sum over all of the rounds from T equals one to capital T of delta T, PT, YT, which remember is just the change in calibration error between day T and uh, day T minus one. Um, that this is a telescoping sum. The calibration error at day zero was uh, was zero. Um, and so in the end, I just get the calibration error of the whole transcript, right? So if I want to bound the expected calibration error of the whole transcript, it suffices to understand the expected change in calibration error from day to day, right? And that's the kind of thing we've just built up the machinery to do. Um, okay. So, you know, we've written the change in calibration error as the sum of these two terms, uh, sort of the interesting term and the boring term, but we, you know, the boring term is still there. We still need to grapple with it. So what do we have? Um, well, we've got the calibration error of our final transcript. I can write that as, well, the sum uh, of the change in calibration error at each term, which I can bound using this little lemma we proved over here. So this is at most the sum over all of the rounds of the interesting part, which we called delta one, plus um, the boring part, which we didn't give a name to, but it's just one over T times the number of times under this transcript that we've played prediction PT. Okay. Now, we have a lemma bounding the expectation of this thing for all Y. This term would be sort of annoying to deal with under expectations, but that's okay. That This term is sort of nice enough that we can deal with this term in the worst case. We don't have to worry about taking expectations over this term. So I just wanna like note that this 
is only smaller than um, the sum from t equals one to t of sort of this interesting change in calibration error, delta one t of p t y t. This is evaluated summing over the terms of the actual transcript plus the maximum over all possible transcripts uh, pi tilde, not necessarily the real one, but like the worst transcript of the sum from t equals one to t of this term evaluated not on the real transcript, but on the worst transcript. So one over t times the number of times uh, that according to this worst case transcript, et twiddle, what was played at round t on the worst case transcript was played. Okay, it's just saying, look, you know, the calibration error is sort of the sum of terms that are defined in terms of the real transcript. But if when summing over the second set of terms, I don't sum over the real transcript, but like the worst transcript that could possibly exist, that's only going to make it bigger because the real transcript is, you know, can't be worse than the worst transcript ever. Okay. Um, and the reason why this is going to be helpful is because I now want to take the expectation of both sides over pi. And I sort of, you know, this thing, I, I know how to take the expectation over pi. We just bounded that. This thing, I don't really know how to take the expectation over pi, but it doesn't depend on pi anymore. So that's okay. This is just a constant now. Okay. So, um, you know, okay. Now, when I take the expectation over pi of the left hand side, the calibration error, which is the thing that I want to bound in this theorem. Um, well, what did we say? We said that, or did I erase what we said? I think we bounded each of these terms by two over TM in expectation. Does that sound familiar? Two over TM. So there's, you know, okay, this is just a sum, right? So by linearity of expectation, the expectation of the sum is the sum of the expectations. So it's the sum over T terms, each of which has expectation two over TM. And so the whole sum in expectation evaluates just to two over M. Okay, the first term from our theorem. Okay. Plus, okay, we still have this thing to deal with. Let's call this star. So we still have to deal with star. So whatever our final theorem is, it's going to be two over M plus star. We're hoping we can bound star by this. So let's bound star. So we want to bound in the worst case over transcripts. So, you know, like for any transcript pi twiddle, I want to be able to bound the sum over all of the rounds of one over T 
times the number of times in this hypothetical transcript up through round t minus one. Um, PT twiddle has been played. Okay, like that's star. That's the thing we need to bound. So note, you know, I don't know much about this transcript, but like I do know about counting, right? So what I know is that um, if PT twiddle equals P, then when I look at the number of times under this transcript at round T that I've played P, it's got to be equal to the number of times under this transcript yesterday that I pay, played P plus one. Right, every time I play P, the count for the number of times I played P has to increment. Right, like that's true for every transcript. So it's true for, for this transcript. It's just how counting works. So, Um, I can divide this sum into two sums. I can say, okay, you know, right? Like right now I'm just summing up over every time steps, over every time step. But what I can do is I can say, okay, let's partition the time steps instead of summing them, summing up over all of them at once. Let's sum up first over all of the time steps for which I predicted zero. Then let's sum up over all of the time steps for which I predicted one over M, then two over M, then three over M. It's just a different way of summing up over the same set of things. Okay, so that's what I'll do. I'll say, okay, you know, first I'm going to sum up over all of the different predictions that I could have made. And then I'm going to sum up over the, the sort of days on which I made those predictions, the T such that the prediction that I made was P. And then I'll just sum up over the same quantity. Right, I mean, I'm just, it's the same sum. I just like rearrange the terms. Okay. Um, but now this sum is like a little easier to understand. Because, you know, let's consider some particular prediction P. How does the number of times I've played it evolve? Starts at one, then it's two, then it's three, then it's four. Okay, it's an easy sequence. So I can write this as sum over all of the predictions that I might have made. Now, the sum over the time, you know, the ordering of the times I made that prediction. First, the term corresponding to the first term I made that prediction, then the second time I made that prediction, then the third time, right? That sum is going to start from one, the first time I made the prediction, and it's going to go up to the last time I made the prediction, the number of times I made the prediction. And the sum is, you know, the terms in the sum are going to be one over T K, right? Because the, you know, the terms in the sum are one over T times the number of times I played it, which would go one, two, three, up through, through the number of total number of times I played it. Okay. Now, What I don't know, of course, is, you know, how 
the number of times I've, you know, how my play over these M plus one actions are distributed. Maybe I played one of the actions every single time, in which case this is just a single sum over, you know, one plus, you know, one half plus one third plus one fourth, all the way up through one over uh, one over T. Um, or, you know, like maybe they were distributed evenly, right? Like maybe for each of the M plus one actions, I played them T over M plus one many times. That would give me a different outcome, right? But, you know, if I look at the sequence, right, like one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth, it's a, it's a you know, the terms are decreasing. So if I'm looking at the worst case transcript, right, like, like where are you, how are you going to choose the actions to make this sum as large as possible? You're going to evenly distribute them because, the, you know, if I want the next term in the sum to be as large as possible, I want to play the action that so far has been played the least frequently because right, the terms in the sum diminish with the number of times I've played the action. And so the worst case is every day I play the thing that was played least frequently, which corresponds to playing evenly across all of the action. Okay, so this is at most, um, you know, M plus one, the number of actions I'm summing up over, uh, well, over T, might as well bring the one over T out. That's not relevant to the sum. Of the sum, it's from K equals one to T over M. If I've played the actions evenly, I've played each one of them T over M many times. of one over K. Okay. Now, uh, this thing has a name, right? The sum one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth all the way up to, you know, one over N. That's, that's the nth harmonic number. Okay, so we can, this has a name. So we can, um, you know, say its name, right? So this is just M plus one over T times the t, <clears throat> t over m harmonic number. And um, a fact that is not too hard to derive or look up is that the nth harmonic number is bounded by log n plus one. Okay, and it's, you know, uh, lower bounded by log n. So a good mental model is that it's like equal to log n, but if you wanna be pedantic, it's bounded by log n plus one. So this thing is bounded by um, m plus one over t times log of t over m plus one, just bounding the t over m harmonic number. And so we're done. Because our calibration error is bounded by two over m plus m plus one over t times log t over m plus one, which is exactly what we said. Okay. So even though you don't necessarily know what you're doing in terms of prediction, you can always guarantee that someone can't tell, at least if they only look at, if, at least if they only evaluate you with calibration error. Make sense? Questions? Okay. Let me now point out that we can do exactly the same thing with quantiles. And I'm not gonna spend another two hours deriving the same algorithm for quantiles because it's it's very similar, but let me um, maybe give you the definitions and the theorem, and maybe if we have time, I'll point you to like the one place in the argument that is a little bit different. Okay. But everything, you know, essentially everything we did works out directly the same way for quantiles.
Okay, so first of all, you know, we can define quantile calibration error in the online setting uh, by adapting our batch definition of quantile calibration error to just the empirical distribution of the transcript in exactly the same way that we did for means. And what we get, you know, in exactly the same way is that if I just look at our old definition of like squared quantile calibration error over the empirical transcript, um, what that evaluates to is what I'll call uh, Q2 of pi, which is just the average over each of the predictions that I could make in my discrete grid of the sum over all of the rounds for which I predicted E Where, where it's different, it's not the difference between my prediction and the label, which is what I would do for means, but it's the difference between the target quantile, like 95%, and the frequency with which the label was actually less than my predicted quantile, uh, divided by the square root of the number of times I predicted P, all of that squared. Okay, so this is just what happens when you evaluate our definition of, of um, quantile calibration error on the empirical transcript. And this is exactly the same definition of, of mean calibration error, except, you know, where before we had, uh, you know, the difference the average difference between our prediction and the label, y minus p, now we have sort of the difference between our target quantile, like 95%, and the empirical frequency with which we cover um, the label, which, you know, should also be 95% if we want to have low error. Okay. So, um, you know, when we were analyzing mean calibration error, we had these quantities V that we kept track of. So let's keep track of quantities W instead. Uh, sort of analogously, we've got these quantities W, again, indexed by time and the prediction. And they're just, again, the term corresponding to one of the predictions in our calibration loss inside the square. So just the sum over all of the rounds of the indicator, the prediction we made was P times the difference between our target quantile and our empirical frequency of coverage. over square root of the number of times we played P. Um, okay, but, but not squared. And so just like our V quantities, the point is these things can be positive or negative. Remember that's like a crucial part of the algorithm. Okay, these things can be positive or negative. And once again, since we're dividing by square root of the number of times we played the thing, you know, I don't know if this is positive or negative, but once again, the magnitude of this thing cannot be bigger than the square root of the number of times I've played P. And that fact will play the same role as it did before. Okay. Now, Prove the same lemma that we proved before. I won't prove it again, but let me give you the statement. It's that
if we look at our change now in quantile calibration error from round S to round S plus one. Okay, once again, this is a function of the prediction that I make tomorrow and the label that realized tomorrow. This is bounded by one over T times two times this W quantity corresponding to the action that I play tomorrow over the square root of the number of times I've played that action. Times Q minus the indicator that the prediction that I make tomorrow is larger than the label. This was sort of like the interesting term. Okay, plus we have the boring term again. Plus one over the number of times we've played this quantity. Okay, so this is sort of a direct analog of the change in calibration loss lemma we proved for means, but the difference is instead of again, y minus uh, p, it, it's the difference between our target quantile and the events that we cover. Okay, and again, this is a constant defined at round S. The term, this is this term here is the only one that depends on what the adversary is doing. Okay. Now here, maybe you can start to see why things are gonna become a little bit different. So, so let's think about sort of this mini max view of things where, you know, like if, suppose the adversary went first, would we necessarily have an immediate strategy that would make this thing small, right? So what does it mean that the adversary goes first? The adversary like announces a strategy. They, they announce a distribution over Y, okay? And the question is, knowing a distribution over Y, do we have a P that we can play that's gonna make this small? And the problem is, right? So, so, so like for means, I would just predict the expectation of um, the adversary's label distribution. And that would make, you know, if P was the expectation of Y, then the expectation of Y minus P would be zero. Now, suppose the adversary plays like a point mass. The adversary just says, okay, like, you know, tomorrow the label, you know, the label is going to be 0.2. Then whatever fixed thing I play, it will either cover the label or it won't. It, it's not going to cover it with probability Q. So even if the adversary goes first, if I want to play something that's going to, um, if I want to play something that's going to have like close to, you know, the target coverage Q, uh, I'm going to need to assume that they don't, they're not playing like a point mass, that they're playing at least a continuous probability distribution. If they're playing a continuous probability distribution, then at least there is a Qth quantile I can read off of their distribution. And it's worse than that because I'm playing in this like a discrete grid, right? So it's not enough that it's a continuous probability distribution if all of the action is between two of my grid points, right? So I'm going to need to assume just as we did earlier when analyzing these batch algorithms with pinball loss, that actually the adversary is playing some distribution that is not too concentrated on any single point, that is sort of Lipschitz, row Lipschitz, meaning, you know, the CDF of the distribution doesn't like, you know, if I, if I wiggle, uh, if I wiggle, if I wiggle P by some epsilon or like some one over M maybe, um, that I shouldn't change the coverage probability by more than rho times epsilon or rho over M. Okay. So if, 
I assume that the adversary is restricted to playing row Lipschitz distributions, then if I imagine that the adversary goes first, there's always something that I can come back with and play that has coverage. Um, okay, not exactly Q, but Q plus or minus rho over M. And I can make this term rho over M. Okay. Um, um, oh, no. So, so it's, it's not that I'm assuming a fixed distribution from which the adversary is playing. That would be in the batch setting. Now I'm saying, look, what the adversary can do every day is they can pick a distribution. You know, Their action space is now more limited. They have to pick a row smooth distribution, but they can pick any row smooth distribution. So it's, it's still, um, you know, like, in the, like when we analyzed the batch setting, quantile calibration, also we had to assume that the distribution was row smooth. There, there was a fixed row smooth distribution. Uh, now we're sort of saying, okay, well, you know, and, and that was an assumption we didn't need to make for mean calibration in the batch setting either, right? So in the batch setting, we didn't make any assumption on the distribution in the batch setting, and we also didn't make any assumption on the adversary in the sequential setting. Here, we did have to make an assumption in the batch setting, row smoothness, uh, I'm going to make exactly the same assumption on the actions of the adversary, but the adversary can still choose them arbitrarily. And um, a couple of things, I guess, like, so, so rho is going to show up in our final bounds, but like, you know, as I make rho bigger and bigger, it's a weaker and weaker constraint on the adversary. Um, and if I want, I can, like, enforce the assumption by running, like, if I run the algorithm, like suppose I'm playing an adversary who's not constrained in any way. And they're picking Ys that, that could be not drawn from row smooth distributions. If I perturb the Ys by a little bit of random noise, then uh, you know, like a uniform distribution on plus or minus uh, one over rho, then the perturbed Ys are drawn from a row smooth distribution. And I can run my algorithm and have its guarantees hold on the row smooth distribution. And if I, you know, equivalently, I can perturb the P's by plus or minus one over rho and get the same coverage. So it's a, like the algorithm here looks very much like the mean multi-calibration algorithm in that although it is technically randomized, it basically doesn't randomize. It randomizes just between playing some P and P plus one over M. But the observation is that since, although that only works for row smooth distributions, if I want to remove that assumption, I can randomize a little more. I can, you know, pick P according to this almost deterministic distribution, but then randomly shift it between uh, plus or minus one over rho, and that's equivalent to playing against a row smooth distribution. So, so like, if I don't want to make the assumption of row smoothness, I can make up for it by making my algorithm a little more stochastic. But I don't want the algorithm to be too stochastic because I don't want to cheat. Okay. Um, okay. So, so you, you know, I've like given you the argument for why you would expect the term here that we were previously able to make equal to two over m which sort of corresponded to, you know, matching the adversary's, um, matching the adversary's expected label up to our discretization error, which is on the order of one over M. Why here, we, if the adversary is playing a row smooth distribution, the equivalent is that we sort of expect to be able to match it up to row over M. Okay. And, um, okay, once again, of course, the adversary is not really going first, so it's not an algorithm. We can't play an algorithm that says, um, you know, just play p equal to the you know qth quantile of the adversary's label distribution because we don't really know what that is. Instead, what we need to do is try instead of trying to make this term equal to zero, we need to randomize to try to make this term equal to zero. Okay, and we can do that again for the same reason because these terms can be positive or negative. And so we can always find an adjacent pair that have opposite sign and randomize between them. Now, the adjacent pair aren't exactly adjacent. They're adjacent up to one over M. 
Okay. So when we're doing the analysis, when we want the terms to cancel out, right? Because you know, we've picked an adjacent pair and a distribution over the adjacent pair so that these terms are zero in expectation, you know, like to get those terms to cancel out, we need to sort of squint and pretend that, you know, P and P plus one over M are really the same point. They're not. The coverage of P plus one over M is different than the coverage rate of P. But if it, the distribution's row smooth, it's only different by um, row over M. Oh, there could be multiple pairs that are adjacent, yeah. uh, and we can use any of them. Okay. And and for for quantiles, if you're going to use them for prediction intervals, this is a good reason to pick the smallest such pair. Okay. Anyways, um, you can go through that argument, which is exactly the same, except in this one aspect that I just tried to impress upon you that we need to assume row smoothness uh, so as to compare the coverage rate of P versus the coverage rate of P plus one over M. Except for that, the argument is exactly the same. Um, and what you get is that There exists an algorithm. And again, um, here, so I'm not writing it out again, I'm saying there exists an algorithm, but this is a very constructive proof. It's essentially the same algorithm we already saw that is just randomizing between adjacent buckets, where now, whenever we wrote V before, we just write W. There exists an algorithm that guarantees that the expected quantile calibration error, an expectation over the transcript generated in the worst case over adversaries, is now at most, well, before we had a term that was two over M, now it's two rho over M. Okay, so let's be clear about what rho is. That guarantees that for all, row smooth adversaries, by which I mean adversaries that are constrained at every round to play distributions over labels that are row Lipschitz. For all row smooth adversaries, the calibration error is two row over M plus M plus one over T uh, times log of t over m plus one. So the same thing we had before, except with a row term now. And again, we get to pick m. m is a parameter of the algorithm. So setting m now to be square root of two rho t over log t, we get that the expected calibration error is on the order of the square root of rho log t over t. Okay, so the same thing as we got for means, except we're paying for the smoothness parameter now. Okay, so the full details of that are in the notes, but but it's quite similar to the, the mean multi-calibration, sorry, the mean calibration algorithm, the one difference being you know, the needed assumption of row smoothness so that we can translate between shifting this threshold up by one plus M to an increase in the coverage rate of rho over M. Okay. And otherwise, that's, I'll see you guys next time. And I guess next Friday is fall break. So next time is in two weeks. Thank you.